Good morning. I'm Todd Gaines and I'm a weed scientist at Colorado State. I'm Olivia Todd. I'm a graduate student at CSU in the weed science program and we're here in Boulder, Colorado in Boulder County to talk to you today about kochia. And kochia is a species we work on a lot here. As you can see as you take a look around we're in an incredibly dense monoculture of kochia. This is a species that's an annual, has very high seed production, outcrossing, lots of genetic diversity. So you can see how well adapted it is to a site like this where we have some interesting soil conditions. That's right, we have lime conditions in the soil. Uh, kochia tends to like very saline and dry conditions. It'll be a problem here in this open space as well as in most cropping systems in Colorado. Another characteristic about kochia when you think, uh, if you have a year where it gets away from you and you have a big stand of kochia, it makes a lot of seed and this is what you're dealing with the next year. So next we'll be taking a look at some herbicide treatments that can deal with this kind of incredible population density. In this plot, we're looking at a mixture treatment of method, which is aminocyclopyrichlor at eight ounces, and esplanade, which contains endazoflam at seven ounces per acre. Method or aminocyclopyrichlor is what's known as a synthetic auxin or a plant growth regulator. And endazoflam is a cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor. It's helpful to take a look at the symptoms from both of these. Endazoflam is very characteristic. When you take a look at the roots of this kochia plant that we've pulled up from the treatment, you can see there are no lateral branching roots happening. So this cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor is active in the soil. It's going to inhibit the root, the growth of these roots. The plant's not able to take up the water and nutrients it needs and it'll die. And if we pulled up one of these healthy kochia around here, you'd see lateral roots coming off all over the place. And then for the aminocyclopyrichlor, you can see very characteristic at the growing point here, we can see how the leaves have a lot of curling, the stem is thickened, the internode length is shortened, so a really classic uh, plant growth regulator symptom. And here when we take a look at the rates, Esplanade here is at its full rate and Method is only at about half of its rate. You can see that we get really good kosher control and even allowing for some of the grasses to grow back. If you decided to use a higher rate of method, you would be able to achieve a bare ground. In this plot, we're taking a look at a pre-emergence treatment of sulfentrazone. Sulfentrazone is classified as a PPO inhibitor, and that enzyme is called protoporphyrogen oxidase. It's one that interacts with photosynthesis. So when you use a PPO inhibitor, you get some really interesting symptoms to the leaves. This is a kochia that came up through the pre-emergence treatment, but has uh, definitely been exposed to the herbicide. What you're looking at is these leaves really burned off, uh, yellowed. If you saw this within just a day or two of when it happen happened, the leaves would look more bleached, uh, kind of water soaked. So this is uh, the kind of really you know photoreactive damage that you see with a PPO inhibitor. Sulventrazone is one of those products that, when applied, you can consider the soil pH. When the soil is more basic, you need less product because the herbicide is more bioavailable. So here we can see that we had really good pre-control, and so if you're considering seeding grasses in your plot for restoration purposes, you can use this product post when the grass has at least two tillers. And then for restoration, you may want to wait until planting your grasses in the fall so that the residual activity pre-emergence of the sulfenture zone has some time to clear out of the system before you go in with your restoration seeding. Here you can see we're standing in a pre-treatment of promenade, which is flumioxazin, a PP, another PPO inhibitor. You can see that this treatment doesn't have much activity on kochia, though it is pretty effective on other small seeded broadleaves. Flumioxazin efficacy can be affected if you have a lot of organic matter. This product can get tied up in that organic matter. Another aspect of flumioxazin is that it has a, a different fit as far as restoration, so it has uh, less residual time. So if you're thinking about when you might be uh, seeding in a new species, less residual time with flumi, would often be used in a mixture, and we'll take a look at another plot where flumioxazin is, is in a mixture. And then it also can be quite good if you already have an established stand of grasses that are up and growing, you can use it for the pre-emergence control of your small seeded annual weeds, especially if you're not using it with some of the more active adjuvants, things like crop oil concentrate can really heat up the activity of flumioxazin. 
Here we're in the treatment of pre bandival or dicamba. When it comes to kochia, we see a lot of dicamba resistance post in agricultural fields and in open spaces. So in the greenhouse, we wanted to test to see if there was a possibility to control dicamba resistance plants post-emergent, but in a pre-emergent treatment in the field. And the interesting thing that uh, we've seen in the greenhouse is when you apply dicamba pre, you can control the same populations that are resistant to the post-treatment at a typical pre uh, application rate. And that plays out here in, at this site. Now, we don't necessarily suspect dicamba resistance uh, at this location, but you can see that you do pick up uh, activity on kochia pre-emergence with dicamba. And it's always interesting to take a look at the mode of action. Of course, dicamba can have some very specific uh, symptoms that are characteristic. We can see here uh, dicamba is a synthetic oxidant or plant growth regulator. You can see the curling of leaves, thickening of stem. Notice how the stem no longer grows straight, it's, it's curved. These leaves are drooping down, that's called epinasty. And the, the growing point will start growing down. The stem is going to swell and eventually the, the plant's going to stop growing. When you apply dicamba post, you'll see this uh, much more severely but you can see that it's happening uh, pre, and certainly the roots, you know, we're not getting those secondary and branching roots. Uh, the, the root growth is gonna be very stunted once it hits the dicamba treatment. Here we're looking at a plot treated with a product called Piper. This is a mixture of flumioxazin, the PPO inhibitor that we looked at by itself earlier, together with pyroxysulfone. We talked about how flumioxazin is a PPO inhibitor, so that we've covered that mode of action. Pyroxysulfone has a different mode of action. It's called a very long chain fatty acid elongates. Some other herbicides in this group include esmetolachlor, acetochlor, and these are known that they only have a pre-emergence activity. They affect the roots of the germinating seedling. Virtually no post-emergence activity. The target site for these herbicides is the enzyme called very long chain fatty acid elongase. So this is in the pathway for lipid synthesis in the cell. So the cell needs lots of lipids, fats, waxes to make the cell membranes and grow. That's why a rapidly growing roots tip is really damaged if it doesn't have enough of, of these lipids. A key characteristic of herbicides in this group is the selectivity by placement. So the herbicide is only going to have activity in that part of the soil uh, where it's located in pyroxysulfone really doesn't move much and we have a nice example of this here. These two kochia plants are technically escapes from this treatment but you can see the really nice example of selectivity by placement. On this larger kochia we can see that this part of the root is well intact where when the top inch of the soil there's no lateral rooting. Here on this smaller seedling you can see the lack of lateral roots as well and this has to do once again with the plant's lack of ability to create the cells that it needs to make lateral roots. When you take a look at the plot as a whole, you can see, of course, we've got really good activity uh, coming from the pyroxysulfone. And this can be uh, pretty useful when you're dealing with a situation where you have established perennials, like trees, big grasses. The so roots are gonna be down below that zone where the herbicide is, and their growing roots won't be affected. So it's very possible that what we're seeing in this plot is only attributed to the pyroxysulfone treatment. Here we're in a plot that was applied pre with atrazine. And you can see that we got really, really good kochia control. Atrazine is a photosystem two inhibitor. So when you inhibit photosystem two, the energy coming from the sunlight, instead of going into the photosystem and going into carbon fixation, instead ends up generating reactive oxygen species that break down the lipid membranes, cause lipid peroxidation, lots of reactive oxygen species, and uh, the cells start breaking apart. So you see uh, leaf damage and uh, the plant stops growing quite quickly. And this is a very effective herbicide. Uh, atrazine was labeled for years in rangeland, uh, but that label was lost due to the groundwater contamination issues that can happen with a, a product with the residual that atrazine has and the uh, ability to, to move into groundwater. Also used a lot in corn production, is naturally selective in corn due to metabolism in corn. And uh, both due to resistance and adoption of other herbicides in corn, that use has gone down. So when you look at this plot, we're seeing essentially 100% controlled atrazine. 
Had we been at this site 20 years ago, we probably would have seen 0% control because there's so much resistance. Why has it gone away? Well, that primarily has to do with the fact that kosha is a very prolific annual. So over time, we can see fitness costs come and go depending on the use of the herbicide. So in this case, atrazine is making a nice comeback for range, although we may not be able to apply it um, due to the fact that the fitness cost has gone away over time. The fitness cost comes from the resistances based on a mutation in the photosystem 2 gene called PSBA. And that's really important for how well photosynthesis functions. When you have this mutation for atrazine resistance, it doesn't work as well. So the plants are shorter, they don't grow as fast, they're not as effective, and they're at a real disadvantage to kochia without the mutation. So over the course of several years, the kochia that's susceptible makes a lot more seed, outcompetes the kochia that has the resistance mutation, and you'll see the frequency of that resistance uh, go down over time. We're here in a Teller post uh, treatment here, and Teller is chlorosulfuron. This is an ALS inhibitor, and we can see that we're not getting any kochia control here. Um, Teller still has a lot of really important application for mustard species, Canada thistles, etc. in rangeland. So chlorosulfuron was introduced in the early 80s and was just incredibly effective on kochia. But to understand how resistance has become wide, so widespread, we can talk about the mode of action. So ALS is a protein that's involved in uh, amino acid biosynthesis, which is uh, required for proteins, and specifically branch chain amino acids. It's an interesting enzyme because these herbicides block the access to the active side of that protein. And there are lots of different mutations that can happen that change how those herbicides bind, whether it's a sulfonylurea like chlorosulfuron, or some of the other ALS herbicides like imidazolinones. Uh, they have uh, binding sites on the outside of this enzyme. And so what's happened is these different mutations can occur. They don't have much fitness cost, contrasted with atrazine where you see the high fitness cost. Basically, these mutations can spread. They're nuclear inherited, so they spread through cross-pollination, which happens in kochia, as well as tumbling and dispersal of seeds. So within a few years, resistance to chlorosulfuron became widespread, and you can see still very widespread. You basically really wouldn't use chlorosulfuron to control kochia anywhere at this point in time. Here we're standing in a pre-applied Prowl H2O or pendimethalin plot. Um, pendimethalin is a microtubule inhibitor, and you can see that it has pretty good control on kochia. There is a roadside label for this in open space, and it's relatively inexpensive to use. Pendimethalin is in the dinitroaniline chemical family. So if you're familiar with these, these are the yellow herbicides. They really will stain your application equipment, your clothes if you get it on you. I think they even started as a, a clothing dye for that yellow color. But they have this residual herbicide activity and something characteristic of the microtubule mode of action is that you get, uh, again, as a pre-emergence, you'll see the activity on the roots. So when you're looking at these two kochia seedlings right here, they were able to grow through, and they're growing a little bit, but you can see how the roots are, uh, their growth is really inhibited. There are no lateral root, uh, roots branching out. And uh, again, the, that's a result of those microtubules are not forming correctly. The cells aren't dividing correctly. When you look at this under a microscope, it's really interesting. The cells are all mashed up and they're just not able to divide in their regular way. So see uses for pendimethalin in some crops as well. We're here in a post application of Vista or fluoroxapir at the single application rate, 12 ounces per acre. You can see that we get pretty moderate control of kochia here with a few escapes. Whether or not these are resistant is currently unknown, but we have been seeing fluoroxapir resistance in range settings. What we can determine from this plot and from this field tour as a whole is that there are plenty of other options to control kochia without putting all of the pressure on fluoroxapir. We can see from the ALS treatment, or maybe learn from it, that when you put your pressure on one herbicide, that resistance will arise. And keeping in mind that when, as fluoroxapir is a synthetic auxin, there are some synthetic auxins that don't work well on kochia, such as 2,4-D. And fluoroxapir is such an interesting synthetic auxin in that it has great kochia activity, but not so much on other species. 2,4-D is another interesting one, you know, generally great broadleaf activity, but not really so much activity on kochia. So fluoroxapir has become really a relied upon product 
And that's where this, again, resistance management lesson is so important. To show you a little bit about the mode of action, you can see that with the fluoroxapir as a, as a synthetic oxygen or plant growth regulator, something very characteristic is the stem will really swell up. You can see that the new growing point, when you feel this, it's, it's very hard, almost kind of crunchy. And you can see how the new leaves are uh, really curled up, um, they're pointing down. But the plant will stay green for quite a while, we kind of call this the green skeleton. And this plant is not going to regrow, but it's also not going to disintegrate for a while. These were treated about three weeks ago, so in another week or two, you'll start to see complete plant death. But it's quite a different uh, response with the herbicide compared to uh, some other modes of action. In this plot, we're looking at Vista XRT or fluoroxapir at the highest use rate that you can use uh, both for a one-time application and also for the total product that you can apply over the season, 23 ounces per acre. So this is a high rate, again, applied post-emergence. As you can see, very, very good control, uh, but we also want to look at some interesting trends that we see in these post-emergence applications. When you're assessing control both in, the, uh, in your field or even if you're doing work in the greenhouse, it's important to make the distinction. Because kochia sprayed with fluoroxapir does remain green for quite a while, it's important to be able to tell the difference between a surviving plant and something that is eventually going to die by application. We've seen a lot in my research at CSU um, accessing multiple fluoroxapir resistant lines. It's not uncommon to see a few escapes when you're applying but also that we've seen very high resistance levels um, in kochia to fluoroxapir. In addition, there have been several more lines reported that aren't currently updated on the Weed Science website that we're looking at from all different parts of the US and Canada.